All right. Um, so today we're going to be looking at Unfurt's challenge. So this is in between Beowulf's arrival and his um, first night in Herat, where he's going to be fighting with Grendel. Uh, Unfurt is another of uh, Hrothgar's soldiers. Um, he's relatively important, and basically he doesn't like the fact that Beowulf is being like lauded as this super important person. Um, and he thinks that, you know, he's like, I'm pretty important too. Why is nobody impressed with the things that I'm doing? So he's got a little bit of jealousy for Beowulf. So he's going to call him out in front of everybody. This leads us to kind of talk about boasting and how important it is in Anglo-Saxon culture. Um, so heroes would boast, they would be prideful. Um, that was just kind of one of those things that was a big mainstay of Anglo-Saxon culture, but you had to be able to back it up. Um, you couldn't just, you know, make boastful statements and then be a big wuss. Um, it, people would, you know, kind of, they would kick you out of society. They would ignore you. They'd make fun of you. They would do all these kind of horrible things to you. Um, so Unferth and Beowulf are both going to do a little bit of boasting here, but only one of them is going to turn out looking any good. And I think you can guess which one that's going to be. Unferth spoke. Eklaf's son, who sat at Hrothgar's feet, spoke harshly and sharp, vexed by Beowulf's adventure, by their visitor's courage, and angry that anyone in Denmark or anywhere on earth had ever acquired glory and fame greater than his own. So here the, um, the author's kind of making fun of, of Unferth here a little bit, right? He's upset that anyone would ever have more glory than him, right? And he's not, he's not upset um, he thinks it's their fault that he's not more impressive. Um, so he's blaming everybody but himself. You're Beowulf, are you? The same boastful fool who fought a swimming match with Brekka? Both of you daring and young and proud, exploring the deepest seas, risking your lives for no reason but the danger? All older and wiser heads warned you not to, but no one could check such pride. With Brekka at your side, you swam along the sea paths, your swift moving hands pulling you over the ocean's face. Then winter churned through the water, the waves ran you as they willed, and you struggled seven long nights to survive. So when they're saying that winter churned through the water, basically saying that a storm came up, right? Churning is, is kind of a violent um, uh, uh, word here, right? It means that it's like, you know, kind of like boiling almost, okay? Um, so, you know, he's basically calling Beowulf out for being irresponsible um, and for risking both himself and Brekka's lives uh, in this, you know, dumb contest. And at the end, victory was his, not yours. The sea carried him close to his home, to southern Norway, near the land of the Brondings, where he ruled and was loved, where his treasure was piled and his strength protected, his towns and his people. He'd promised to outswim you, outswim you. Bonston's son made that boast ring true. You've been lucky in your battles, Beowulf, but I think your luck may change if you challenge Grendel. Staying a whole night through in this hall, waiting where that fiercest of demons can find you. So he basically, he's like, he's like, one, you challenged Brekka to a race and you put yourselves in danger for no reason and you didn't even win. And all the wins that you've had up to this point are just luck. Um, and Grendel's going to show you how, how, you know, really unskilled you are. So Beowulf doesn't like that, obviously. Beowulf answered at Getho's great son, Ah, Unferth, my friend, your face is hot with ale and your tongue has tried to tell us about Brekka's doings. But the truth is simple. No man swims in the sea as I can. No strength is a match for mine. As boys, Breck and I had boasted, we were both too young to know better, that we'd risk our lives far out at sea, and so we did. Um, so when he says that Unferth's faith is hot with ale, he's basically saying, like, sit down, you're drunk. Um, I'm amazing and, uh, you don't really know the whole story. So I'm going to tell you the whole story so that you know how awesome I am. Each of us carried a naked sword prepared for whales or the swift, sharp teeth and beaks of needlefish. He could never leave me behind, swim faster across the waves than I could. And I had chosen to remain close to his side. I remained near him for five long nights until a flood swept us apart. The frozen sea surged around me. It grew dark. The wind turned bitter blowing from the north, and the waves were savage. Creatures who sleep deep in the sea were stirred into life, and the iron-hammered links of my mail shirt, these shining bits of metal woven across my breast, saved me from death. A monster seized me, drew me swiftly toward the bottom, swimming with its claws tight in my flesh. But fate let me find its heart with my sword, hack myself free. I fought that beast's last battle, left it floating lifeless in the sea. So you'll note he talks about fate here, right? Unferth says it's luck that has allowed Beowulf to be as wonderful as he is. And Beowulf says it's fate. Fate let me find its heart. Um, so the difference there is that, you know, luck is just something that happens by chance. 
fate is predetermined. And Bailoff's argument is that he is predetermined for greatness and thus he, you know, always will be. The other thing he says is that, you know, no one is as fast as I am. The reason that I even stayed close to Brecca was to keep him safe, right? And then, you know, we got separated by this massive storm that churned up the sea. Other monsters crowded around me, continually attacking. I treated them politely, offering the edge of my razor-sharp sword. But the feast, I think, did not please them, filled their evil bellies with no banquet-rich food thrashing there at the bottom of the sea. By morning, they decided to sleep on the shore, lying on their backs, their blood spilled out on the sand. Um, so Beowulf is showing us how clever he is here, right? He's not just good with a sword, he's good with words. Um, so he's using this kind of extended metaphor of a banquet, and he's using this kind of like elevated, kind of ridiculously formal language to talk about all the murder that he's committing, um, just to show how kind of clever he is, right? Uh, he filled their bellies with steel, not with food. Um, and then she said by morning, they had decided to sleep on the shore, kind of saying like, you know, they're choosing to sleep when in reality, Beowulf killed them. And then they just kind of washed up on shore. Um, so again, the fact that Beowulf goes into water to fight creatures who's that, that is their native habitat um, just shows us what an incredible warrior here he is, right? He's taking every um, kind of detriment, right? He's, he's not equipped to fight in water and yet he can still best massive monsters whose only job is to swim around in water and, you know, kill things. Afterwards, sailors could cross that sea road and feel no fear. Nothing would stop their passing. Then God's bright beacon appeared in the east. The water lay still. And at last I could see the land, windswept cliff walls at the edge of the coast. Um, God's bright beacon there is a cunning for the sun, right? We have lots of cunnings here. Um, he talks about sea roads. He talks about, um, oh, where was that other one? Uh, oh, where was it? Ocean space, right? Sea paths. All of those are all um, kind of talking about the different like passages between uh, between Norway and and um, in that kind of Arctic Ocean. Um, so we have lots of cunnings kind of involved here. So those are good for you to always keep an eye on. Fate saves the living when they drive away death by themselves. Lucky or not, mine, nine was the number of sea huge monsters I killed. What man anywhere under heaven's high arch has fought in such darkness, endured more misery, or been harder pressed? Yet I survived the sea, smashed the monster's hot jaws, swam home from my journey. The swift flowing waters swept me along, and I landed on finished soil. I've heard no tales of you, Unferth, telling of such clashing terror, such contests in the night. Brecca's battles were never so bold. Neither he nor you can match me. And I mean no boast, have announced no more than I know to be true. And there's more. You murdered your brothers, your own close kin. Words and bright wit won't help your soul. You'll suffer hell's fires unforth, forever tormented. Um, so then, you know, Beowulf kind of uh, strikes back at unforth with two things. One, he's like, I've never heard of you. So you must not be very impressive. And two you're a kin slayer, right? And there was nothing worse than that in Anglo-Saxon culture. Um, your kin was sacred. You always, you know, you always protect the family. It's like Italian, like the mob, right? Uh, and the fact that Unferth would have been willing to kill off his own family showed would show that he is, you know, monstrous um, and, you know, just not, not a true man, not an Anglo-Saxon. Eklaf's proud son, if your hands were as hard, your heart as fierce as you think, no fool would dare to raid your hall, ruin Herat, and oppress its prince as Grendel has done. But he's learned that terror is his alone, discovered he can come for your people with no fear of reprisal. He's found no fighting here, but only food, only delight, right? And he's saying, if you're as impressive as you say you are, there's no way that Grendel would ever be here. Um, and instead, he can just, you know, he sees you guys as food. He doesn't even see you as soldiers to fight. There's not even been a fight. He murders as he likes, with no mercy, gorges and feasts on your flesh and expects no trouble, no quarrel from the quiet Danes. Now the Geats will show him courage. Soon he can test his strength in battle. And when the sun comes up again, opening another bright day from the south, anyone in Denmark may enter this hall. That evil will be gone. So Beowulf has now made a proclamation. I'm going to kill Grendel, right? That is a boast. He has to now deliver on that or be thought of as less than a man. Hrothgar, gray-haired and brave, sat happily listening, the famous ring-giver sure at last that Grendel could be killed. 
He believed in Beowulf's bold strength and the firmness of his spirit. There was, a sound, there was a sound of laughter and the cheerful clanking of cups and pleasant words. Then Weltho, Hrothgar's gold-ringed queen, greeted the warriors, a noble woman who knew what was right. She raised a flowing cup to Hrothgar first, holding it high for the Lord of the Danes to drink, wishing him joy in that feast. The famous king drank with pleasure and blessed their banquet. Then Weltho went from warrior to warrior, pouring a portion from the jeweled cup for each till the bracelet wearing queen had carried the mead cup among them and it was Beowulf's turn to be served. She saluted the Geat's great prince, thanked God for answering her prayers, for allowing her hands the happy duty of offering mead to a hero who would help her afflicted people. He drank what she poured at Getho's brave son, then assured the Danish queen that his heart was firm and his hands ready. When we crossed the sea, my comrades and I, I already knew to, that all my purpose was this, to win the goodwill of your people or die in, or die in battle, pressed in Grendel's fierce grip. Let me live in greatness and courage, or here in this hall, welcome my death. Lotho was pleased with his words, his bright-tongued boasts. She carried them back to her lord, walked nobly across to his side. The feast went on, laughter and music, and the brave words of warriors celebrating their delight. Then Hrothgar rose, Hilfdane's son, heavy with sleep, as soon as the sun had gone. He knew that Grendel would come to Herod, would visit that hall when night had covered the earth with its net, and the shapes of darkness moved black and silent through the world. Hrothgar's warriors rose with him. He went to Beowulf, embraced the Geat's great prince, wished him well, and hoped that Herod would be his to command. And then he declared, No one strange to this land has ever been granted what I've given you. No one in all the years of my rule. Make this best of all mead halls yours, and then keep it free of evil. Fight with glory in your heart. Purge Herat, and your ship will sail home with its treasure holds full. Um, so he promised, he's like, all right, tonight Herat is yours. You're the lord of the manor. Purge it, and I will send you home with much gold. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll see how Beowulf does against, uh, Grendel, but if he, um, you know, if he does to Grendel what he just had done for, it will be, uh, quite the win. All right. Um, if you guys have,